Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Jeff Gerstmann Hall of Fame. I'm Jeff Gerstmann. This time around, um, we're inducting a game that, you know, it's, it's at least partially responsible for me getting into this stuff in the first place. If you've been listening to Game Boys to Men, uh, available on available over at patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman. You've heard Glenn and I talk about Mortal Kombat a couple of times. You know, it's uh it's it's come up a, a few times as we as we kind of talk our way through the nineties. But um you know the the release of this game in nineteen ninety two for me um I think about the friendships that were built around it early on. You know, that was something that, you know, with the, one of the first times meeting or uh, ha- hanging out with Ryan McDonald as, as time went on there, like he was the first person who said, Hey, you need to see this thing. And it hadn't made its way to Petaluma, but there was a place up in Santa Rosa, which was the, the bigger town, you know, 10 minutes North, 15 minutes North. Um, there was a place there that had it. Um, this would have had to have been, sometime in 1992 the game was released originally in arcades in uh august of 92 um but this could have been early 93 i was still in high school um 1992 is pretty much the year that's you know that was my junior year of high school um and that was the year i met glenn um And, you know, before too long, we were off to the races, going to different video game events and going to CES in Las Vegas and, and, and seeing all of this stuff. And the, the Mortal Kombat franchise over these last 30 years, um, has kind of always been there as, as I've been getting into it, you know, um, and, and the, um, seeing that first game for the first time. Uh, it felt like it's weird. It's weird to think about now when we look at what, how Mortal Kombat one looks and and, and everything else, there's, there's a lot of stuff about it that, you know, it perhaps hasn't aged as well as some of the other games in the franchise or, or what have you, you know, I think a lot of people look to Mortal Kombat two or perhaps three as, uh, you know, obviously distillations and, and enhancements and refinements on this original concept, but there's something so raw about Mortal Kombat 1. There's something, you know, that's a, it's a game that is wearing its influences on its sleeve. When you hear all the stories about Jean-Claude Van Damme and the martial arts tournament and the, and the thing that they were making, and you look at this cast of characters and you look at the backgrounds and the, the monks and the this and that, like, it has that vibe of that kind of, you know, mid to low tier martial arts film. Um that you know that the, the van damme was kind of churning out or, or getting ready to start churning out they were still good i guess in 92 but you know they, they would he would maybe i don't know when did when did kickboxer come it's a great movie but like um but you know the, like the the cynthia rothrock films like all that stuff you know like like this all the way back to you know bruce lee and, and you know and like some of the just the the influences that, that kind of come out of that like martial arts film like you see that stuff here um and you can pull a lot out of it with your imagination what's there in mortal kombat one is uh not always the the deepest but because of their references because of the the game that they made i i think you know you your your brain wants to fill in the blanks in a lot of these cases and Compared to something like a Street Fighter 2, which was the game of the year, game of the hour, game of whatever, game of the generation, like whatever you want to call it. And compared to some of the SNK stuff, the Neo Geo games that were coming along, Mortal Kombat was something else completely. Um, crude isn't the word, but it's, it's, there, there's, a, there's a rawness to it. Um... And this is, we're going to play some Revision 5 here. This is the last version, I believe, that they put out. 
Uh, and so this is the most patched up and, you know, it, a lot of people talk about Mortal Kombat 12, uh, Mortal Kombat 1, rather, uh, maybe having uh, some, some, a few missing things, missing fatalities, missing whatever, you know, hey, this, that's par for the course all the way back to the actual Mortal Kombat 1, which had all kinds of corner combo problems with Sub-Zero and, you know, the earlier versions of this game are not balanced well. Uh, the earliest versions of this game, I want to say, are even miss missing finishing moves, but that's something that maybe came in more into being with like Mortal Kombat 2, uh, where the, the earliest revisions of the game were like missing endings and stuff. Like, they're, ah, we're shipping it without endings. Like, what? It's an arcade game. You got to ship chips to people so, so that they can upgrade the chips. To, and, and that became part of the marketing. They're like, this is revision three. Like, oh, man. They made patches cool in arcades. You got to hand it to them. Um, seeing this game for the first time, I, I wasn't really, you know, because like, again, like the the description I had from Ryan um, was like, oh, yeah, you, you need to see Mortal Kombat. You know, you can kill people. In it, you know, and it was just like that was the, the focus, obviously. You know, I was 16. Ryan, I think, was also 16, maybe 15. You know, Glenn was 15. We were right there. The wheelhouse for us was the, like, yo, man, you can kill people? I gotta see this shit. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I walk into the arcade that is Ryan's kind of place. You know, it's the, the skate shop turned arcade that he... Uh, mostly hung out at and they had you know they had the SNK stuff that I hadn't really seen that much of of course they had Street Fighter and then they had Mortal Kombat and you know everyone was huddled around Mortal Kombat they're trying to figure out fatalities they didn't know all that stuff like people weren't even really 100% sure how to do some of the moves Kano is a really good example of that where it's like you tap the block button in the middle like people had it down how to do Street Fighter special moves and stuff but Kano's you know Kano's ball is just start rotating the stick and eventually he'll do it. Or hit back forward or back block forward, I think is what it is for Kano's knife, which is like a weird input. Um, and so it immediately had a different feel with the kind of back forward motions and some of the other stuff that it went for as opposed to the quarter circle, half circle stuff, the dragon punch motion that had become... Uh, pretty standard, obviously, in Street Fighter, but a lot of the SNK games were, were kind of following in those footsteps as well. Um, and so we're going to play a little bit. The AI, not always fun to fight against in these, uh, in these well, in, in, in a lot of these Mortal Kombat, especially the arcade ones. Um, but look at this. You got Shang Tsung back there on the throne. You got all these monks assembled to watch. You know, there's blood flying off the guys, which, you know, that wasn't... Mm. They clap. Oh. Like all this digitized audio and... And then you could kill the guy. You punch his freaking head off. I want to say the first fatality I ever did with Sonya's because it's just like, what is it? It's like back, back, forward, forward, block. It's like really pretty simple. Scorpion and Sub-Zero immediately seemed like the cool characters. Um, but, you know, like Johnny Cage has, what, two specials, three specials. He's got the fireball and he's got the shadow kick. And then he's got the, you know, the nut punch or whatever. So, like, that, I guess that counts. Um, and then the, the, the normal attacks feel very generalized. It's high punch, low punch, high kick, low kick. And so you had a lot of these universal inputs that made it very easy for someone to pick up and play because... You know, down in a punch button, did the uppercut. 
Back and low kick did the sweep. Back and high kick did a roundhouse with everybody. And then, you know, you could mash these punches out. And that was, you know, that that's kind of the, you know, the, there's like little additional nuances here and there with uh, some of the characters and the way that they play. But like generally, that's 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 going to get you pretty far. And then against the AI, you could kind of do this also. Well, maybe not with... Maybe is Sonya like the one you can't because she's like... Or like your hitbox is slightly different. That flip kick is so cool. Like, I... Like, I, I, still, I still really like the look of this game. Um, and the idea of, you know, the digitized characters and stuff, obviously, you know, the, the pit fighter had come before this, like there had been digitized graphics in a, in an arcade game, but not like the fidelity in pit fighter is garbage, <laughs> you know, uh, ugh. they had to go back in and record the announcer saying finish her because originally versions of the game did not have Sonya. Then you had some of the secrets here in the pit. I don't know why I'm trying to walk up and throw the AI. It's not going to happen. So this is the thing. This, the AI cheats, so you just got to cheat back. Johnny Cage and I think Raiden and Kano, maybe to a certain extent, but Cage has always been the, the easiest for me to do it with. Is that the, the AI will just take that punch and you can just ship him out if you have to. Like the digitized sound effects of Raiden's electricity being like ever so slightly too loud. Like there's just, it's... I think a lot of people give this game a lot of shit and I think, you know, it, it is it is not the, the deepest game in the world, right? Um, but it's got so much fucking style to it and it's such a specific... Style, such a specific like, you know. Again, that kind of martial arts movie kind of vibe. They really fucking nail it. Shang Sun claps. Like this weird little touch is like, oh, the screen doesn't go dark during Liu Kang's fatality because he's the only good guy in the game, or you know, like like the <laughs> just kind of weird stuff like that. Um, this was, I guess, the first game I played, the first fighting game I played, certainly that had a block button, which was a very big adjustment going from holding back to block. All the Street Fighter. Oops. Oh, man. <laughs> the idea of the mirror match.
and the endurance fights that are coming up after this. Like, it's... I like the sound effects, like the, you know, the, so many of the sound effects for the special moves aren't like digital effects, you know, they're just like out of the sound chip, there's a, you know, these like, they're cool little noises. Ugh. Yeah, this, this technique works perfectly against the characters it works against and does not work well at all against the ones it does not. <laughs> If that makes any sense. Johnny Cage won't punch himself in the nuts. <laughs> Just is real silly. It's like... Eventually, I mean, that's not... So they, they he does that punch to anybody, uh, you know, regardless of gender, like all that stuff now. So I think they realize like it's, you know, in, in, in terms of fairness and usefulness of the move or whatever. But the idea that like, oh yeah, Johnny Cage doesn't punch himself in the nuts. Uh, <laughs> it's like a silly little touch. Oh yeah, it's a little, little a few little juggles there. Um. Yeah, we'll just I'll, I'll we'll get through the 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 we'll beat the game and then uh, mess around with some other characters and some some cheats here in the emulator that'll let us uh, mess around a little bit. I think um, maybe we'll check out some of the home versions too. That's such a iconic part of this. This is so yeah that you know obviously so that was my my genesis with this game was seeing it that at that arcade and then you know it wasn't it would not be long before mortal kombat was everywhere um and it you know it very quickly became like the other fighting game It was Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. Like, the SNK stuff, like, was not, certainly not bad. The Fatal Furies and, you know, maybe, like, I guess King of, the first King of Fighters wouldn't happen until 94, but... So it was, like, Art of Fighting and Fatal Fury and, you know, the first Samurai Showdown and, I don't know, maybe, like, Aggressors of Dark Kombat. I don't know what else, you know, but, like, those were... Those were the SNK fighting games. And I remember Art of Fighting being the one that everyone was kind of initially drawn to. But like, they, I don't know, those games felt like... It's its silly to say now when we think about, you know, because, like, the, the, the criticisms that people lay at Mortal Kombat. But at the time, the SNK fighters felt almost a little gimmicky. Because you had, like, oh, well, you can jump into the back line and then jump back out. And, like, Art of Fighting was like, you have a meter, and if your meter is empty, you can't throw fireballs. And you're like, I don't... I just want to throw fireballs. I don't want to have to fucking charge a meter to throw a fireball. Like I, I still hate Art of Fighting. <laughs> um, but like they've that that's how they you know. And then Samurai Showdown I think was the one that was like, okay, it's a sword game and that's you know kind of a gimmick or whatever. But like it's awesome. Like Samurai Showdown was like the one that was like, okay, this is actually a, a great game. Um. But like Fatal Fury, like it just was weird. Um, and in some ways, like they felt similar enough to Street Fighter to where you're like, well, why would I play this when I could just be playing Street Fighter? You know, that's why like Samurai Showdown was kind of the other, like if, if I had to pick a third fighting game, you know, from around this era, like that would be it. Johnny Cage. 
and the talk about rumors and what what was possible it, it's part of i mean honestly i, I you know they kind of stumbled into it i think but you know because the game was getting patched you had exact you had immediate cases of like well i can't um there's like certain things that only work on certain versions of the board um And so right away that created things of just like, oh, I heard there's a version of the board that lets you kill, you know, like like you had these kind of built-in uh, mysteries about what you could do. It's like, oh, you know, I heard on this version of the board, Johnny Cage can knock off your head three times in a row, which was true. There was a bug in earlier versions of the game that sometimes if you were really mash on, because his fatality is like forward, 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 high punch. But if you mash that out, if you start mashing out those forwards and start mashing on high punch on the earlier versions of the game, occasionally uh, he would go through the animation multiple times and uh, and knock off like another head would appear uh, so that he could knock it off again, you know, because it was a bug, you know. Um, and they corrected that in later revisions, but you know, so it led to that situation where it's like you you had these mysteries. Oops. Um, and so they kind of created this cottage industry for, well, I mean, you know, the, the magazines, I'm sure, were very appreciative of it because it led to a lot of, like, rumor talk and people buying a lot of issues of mag, you know, like, like that stuff probably didn't hurt. Um, And it led to a lot of talk around the arcade. It led to a lot of like, you know, like right off the bat, it was like, oh, I heard this was so-and-so's fatality. If you did it, you know, you have to do it like this, which in the early days, you know, before they'd figured out all the fatalities, that mattered. Um, oh. Yeah, you know, the problem with this game, really, it, you know, it, other than like a lot of other Mortal Kombat games came out after this, and those are, you know, in a lot of ways more compelling to play. Um, but it's the problem that, you know, Street Fighter, you know, just like fighting against the AI is not that fun. Never was. Luckily, with how popular, you know, like you didn't. I, I did because I stopped going to school <laughs> and uh, once I started missing more and more high school to go to the pizza place to play Mortal Kombat 1 and then later Mortal Kombat 2 um, you know there were not a lot of people in the arcade at 1230 on a Tuesday and so I fought the AI a lot uh I picked up hot techniques like this. This is such a cool... I mean, I need to win this round, so I shouldn't jinx it. But this moment is so fucking neat. Yeah, here we go. Just, by the way, here's fucking Goro. <laughs> you kind of have to occasionally stop because he'll... Because this knocks him back. And so if you jump... Yeah, if you get too close, that just happens. When Goro wins, there's an exclamation point. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Fucking Goro, man. <laughs> oh my 
even this yeah i just the noises in this game are so good uh but yeah you know this this his hits do so much fucking damage dude Juggle Goro. Oh, that's bad. Okay. Easy. Simple. <laughs> Look at this big, just not, you know, just animating by floating the sprite around, like no actual animations. Fucking Shang Tsung, man. How do you like how that shit works? <laughs> Damn it. Oh. Yeah, screw that up. Touchdown. So close. Oh no! Oh man. We were right there. Johnny Cage. Um sorry, let me just finish this and then we'll talk a little bit more. <laughs> um, oh, the skulls. There he goes. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get. Why is he not morphing into anyone other than Raiden and Goro? That seems weird. Alright. We might have to turn on cheats just to get through this. Um... And that stuff, the spear and the ice ball, like the idea of you can be like totally immobilized in the middle of a fight. You know, that that was something Street Fighter didn't do. And that felt so powerful. You're like, oh, I froze you. I literally froze you. I'm going to walk up to you and I'm going to uppercut you. And then I'm going to slide. And then if we're in the corner, I'm going to try and do this and do it, you know, like. He also realizes the full potential of the tournament. I like the idea that he just like goes into it going like some of these guys go in and that's actually kind of true to the story today in a lot of ways of just like, yeah, I don't know. 
Mortal Kombat the movie and its many successful sequels. Do you think they knew? No, of course they didn't. How could they? That there would eventually be Mortal Kombat the movie and many successful sequels. Well, successful in air quotes, I guess. Um, Rich Divizio. You know, I would say I was about to say best known as Quan Chi, as as casual Quan Chi, but you know, uh, probably best known as Kano. Um, this was cool too. I mean, this would lead to weird controversy for them later on when Dan Pacina, you know, and I believe Ho Sung, well, Ho Sung Pak would go on to be um superstar in WMAC Masters, right? Uh, but like Dan Pacina would appear in an ad for another fighting game and there was, a, you know, so suddenly Johnny Cage was dead in MK3 and weird stuff like that, but I don't know. This game had a mystery and a mysticism and a wonder about it that like I think it naturally led to, you know, it had a cast of of you know, of, of actors or whatever, you know, martial artists that appeared in the game, you know, which, which is a really cool and weird thing for the time. Um, and this was something midway, you know, I think NBA Jam also really did a lot with this too, where the hidden characters in NBA Jam, a lot of them being people who worked, you know, had midway and stuff like you you looked at these and you were like oh yeah tony ghost yeah you know you you started to recognize some of the names from across multiple games from this smash tv before it you know obviously and uh and nba jam and um i don't know they're just you know the, the, maybe it was because it was developed in the united states and so it was very easy or much easier for people to conduct interviews and things with the creators of Mortal Kombat, whereas like the creators of Street Fighter 2 were, you know, you didn't really get the same, you know, the magazines didn't get the same level of access uh, to Capcom's creative team at the time. And, and so you just didn't really see as much of that stuff. And, um, but, you know, like Ed Boon and John, and John Tobias became household names if, in, <laughs> in my household. Uh, in the households that mattered. Um, Johnny Cage. And this would go on to feel like the biggest, most important thing in the world, you know. Um, especially, you know, to me at age 16 and going on into, you know, into the future of the franchise, 17, 18 and stuff. Like, this was... The idea that Acclaim was bringing these games home, when I started going to CES, that was very quickly the only thing that I was like really interested in. You know, I was like, oh, well, we got it. What the fuck? What's going on with Mortal Kombat? And I remember the first time seeing like the Super Nintendo game running and it was fucked up. And, you know, it was a, it was a very early build of the game, you know? Um, and, uh, and it didn't play well and like well surely by the time it comes out and then the SNES version like no they did not <laughs> they did not fix the problems with that game by the time it came out uh, really but but I remember even then there was something of a discussion around the idea of like well is this going to have fatalities on SNES or, or no and you're like no Nintendo's not letting us do it Sega will have them but it'll there'll be a code and they'll be um and how weird that was, that whole situation with the home ports. Um, but those home ports were obviously massive and um, and great uh, in, in their in their own right. So, you know, you, you, even with a lot of shortcomings, obviously, but like the, they were massive successes because the franchise had become such a big deal by then. Um, and so, you know, like the, this was, I, I talked about it on Game Boys to Men, but you know, something around this era, whether it was MK1 or MK2, because there was some overlap there where like, you know, they were doing, obviously MK1 was coming home, but you started to hear little bits and pieces about what Mortal Kombat 2 might be. Um, 
and uh, you know, Acclaim had a, an autograph session at CES, and they had Ed Boon and John Tobias there, along with I think it was like Dan Pacina dressed up in the Scorpion outfit, and I think the actress that played Sonya in the MK1 era. Um, before it was Carrie Hoskins. Um, well, was it Elizabeth Malecki? Is that what it is? Anyway, I, I think she may have been there. Um, but yeah, you know, it, and, and then they were signing autographs and stuff. And I, I was never an autograph guy, and I was always just kind of like shy or whatever. So, um, so I, I didn't, I, I didn't really want to wait in line to, you know, to, I, I, I'm still this way. I don't, you know, like I would not want to wait in line to like shake, you know, meet somebody for 15 seconds to go, hey, yeah, no, awesome. Like I don't, I don't. It's just not, uh, you know, I don't need a picture with somebody like like that whole that whole thing. Um, like people do it. For, I I think I associate that stuff with like wrestlers, I guess, most directly now. At least when I hear about it. But obviously, there's like sci-fi conventions and and whatever else. But uh, but that's just I don't know. That's never been my thing for a variety of reasons. And so we just kind of sat and watched for a while. And I was like, those are those guys. Those are the guys that made that fucking game. Holy shit. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, it's, I have so many amazing memories attached to the early days of this franchise and, um, you know, we're, we're getting into, we just got into some of that stuff, you know, when Mortal Kombat three was coming out, I, I was between magazine jobs and just like said, fuck it. We're going to, you know, we, we, we decided to go to Reno to go to this arcade convention where MK3 was going to be. And then, so there was an early version of that with a handful of characters and, and seeing that for the first time. And, um, you know, the early versions of Mortal Kombat 2 and seeing that game show up in arcades for the first time. And, um, you know, and, and eventually just kind of going on to, I don't, I don't remember, you know, I, I, I'm, I met Ed Boon probably sometime around Mortal Kombat 4. Um, probably before that. I mean, you know, I, I don't remember. You know, I, I don't remember exactly when, but um, it was definitely sometime in that era of like MK mythologies, MK four special forces, like somewhere around that time. Um, and uh, you know, interviewing him, you know, like whatever, just, you know, meeting him offhand because he's there to, sh to show off the game at an event or, or whatever, not necessarily even doing an interview and stuff like that. And, and you know, being able to kind of like meet those folks on, on those sorts of terms and, and talk to them in a more you know, slightly more casual environment and be able to go like, so what's really, you know, and, um, that was cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's, uh, that still is cool. Um, But yeah, you know, the, the release of Mortal Kombat 1, I think, like, people give it... People don't give it any real... As much credit now as they probably should. Because the quality of the game and how it's aged... And, and, and of course, like, Mortal Kombat 2 is such a better game okay. uh, than, than this. You know, there's so many... There's so much more depth to that gameplay. Um, obviously, more finishing moves and, and everything else that, that comes with that. Um... But I think there's something about the look of this game. Because, you know, remember, Mortal Kombat 2, they did a lot more fantastical art. Where it's just like, here's a tree with a face on it, and here's this, and we got these portals. And, you know, you, like you see them tracing over the digitized images a little bit more to, to give it some uh, a more fantastical look. I think it's a better look overall, but this is raw. This could really happen, man. Mortal Kombat 1, that could fucking happen, man. Uh, and Scorpion, just the the spear and the teleport. What more could you need? Again, it's just conceptually, this, you know, as a, as a move in a fighting game, both of these moves, the teleport and the spear, are crazy. Um, in terms of just like, oh, well, now you're on the other side of the screen. 
and or or you know now you're you're immobilizing the enemy and dragging him over to you <laughs> if i can ever land it And then this, you know? Scorpion win fatality. It's the great. It's it's phenomenal. Like uh, they did a lot with a little uh, in terms of just like again, you know, like I said, the the universal attacks, the the uppercut, the the sweep, the roundhouse, like things that things that the game still has today. Uh, for as much as they change the controls, and that's something I, you know. Footsies here, just pop, 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 no. Um, Scorpion wins. There was a while there in that PS2 era, and it's a, it's a different button now. It's weird. Uh, the buttons are different in Mortal Kombat. It, it's not high punch, low punch. It's front, it's front punch and back punch front kick and back kick which I guess makes sense if we're thinking about things as like well these you know high and low have meaning in terms of you know does this hit high does it hit mid does it an overhead like you know in kind of modern fighting game talk high punch low punch would be confusing in that specific context but the idea of front punch back punch Always struck me as a little weird too. Though they've, I, I feel like the the way the buttons are in the game these days makes a lot more sense than it did in the that PS2 and Xbox era, like like that when they turned it into a partial weapon fighter and, and all that. Like that's a weird era. That's a separate conversation for another time, I suppose. Um. But this game, you know, it, it kept it relatively simple. It, it it created a whole t a ton of mystery. It created a ton of lore. It created like right off the bat, there was a story here that you wanted to know more about. And then as it got expanded upon in Mortal Kombat 2, it started going in all these directions and to the point where, you know, People care about Mortal Kombat lore. I, I care about Mortal Kombat lore. Not to the degree that some folks do. But... I think they've managed to, to craft and maintain um, an increasingly ridiculous universe. And, and they've never stopped kind of having fun with it a little bit. Like, there's inherently ridiculous stuff in these games there always has been you know johnny cage's nut punch the you know knocking people into the pit and having heads and stuff down there like it's it's, it's kind of silly fatalities they're kind of silly you know they'd lean into that later with friendships and babalities and all the other you know the other goofy stuff but like there's always been It rarely felt like they were taking it too seriously, I guess is my point. And as much as, like, this is the most serious one of these games, probably, right? I mean... Unless you want to say, like, Mortal Kombat X is maybe the... But even then, I, that's not... No. Um... And that helps keep it fun, too. So I, I don't, you know, I, I think this game is an easy pick um, in terms of like games that are important to me and, you know, the where I have ended up and whatever else. Um, certainly no game and no franchise is more important to that uh, than Mortal Kombat. And um, this first game, yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of a lot of memories attached to this game. You know, it was obviously like a very, like I said, I was 16 
a lot of uh a lot of really crazy memories kind of all wrapped up in um that time of my life um and and mortal combat was a huge part of that and 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 wanting to know more about Mortal Kombat, like, the, you know, just the the idea of just, like, being inquisitive about the future of video games and, and whatever else, like, I think, you know, I always had that to a degree, um, but perhaps it was the Mortal Kombat franchise when that first started feeling attainable, you know, going to CES and seeing ridiculously early builds of some of these games where it was just, like, a character walking around. It was, like, kind of some of the first times I had seen really 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 unfinished versions of games um and then going to reno and seeing an unfinished arcade game and and just you know like like that stuff is special it's it's cool to be able to it's still like that's something i think you know a lot of people lose sight of for whatever this line of work is now i mean you know there's fewer people doing it every day and and you know the i think the people that are doing it maybe don't necessarily have this specific type of weird reverence for it um and they shouldn't in some ways you know it is it is they they to do the job i think you need to try to be at least somewhat detached that's how i always felt you know especially as i got more serious about it like there's a detachment that you develop not out of jadedness but out of every game developer that comes to see you is trying to blow you away and trying to wow you and trying to talk you into believing that their thing is the next big thing and, and, and whatever else. And it's up to you to not fall for it. And I think uh, a lot of people that are, you know, re reporting on games these days, I think are, are a lot better at, at, at having that level of skepticism. Whereas I think, you know, back in the 90s, you know, you look at the magazines and a lot of the people that were working there and um, you know, and, and some of our, you know, early days doing website stuff. Um, you lot of, had a lot of people with very uncritical views of games. And, um, they were just happy to be there. There was a while there before I, you know, when, when I wasn't getting paid, uh, that I was just kind of like in and around and seeing some of this stuff and going to CES and didn't really have a job that I was very much happy to be there. Um, but by the time, you know, I got, we get into like 96 and get into my time at GameSpot, you know, that was one of the first things that someone there started teaching me was that idea of just like, this is, you know, you're, you're trying to help people not buy bad games, not get ripped off, not get, you know, and, and you know, and remembering that these game developers, they're not your friends. Um, that was a little harsh on one side. I think a lot of people were way too friendly on the other side. The right answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think I came to that realization over the decades. It's like, you know, you, you can be friends with people that make games. They just have to understand that it's more a them problem where sometimes you're going to say that their game is bad. And if that ends a friendship then you have to be like, oh, well, maybe we weren't friends at all. Maybe you were just trying to get a good review. Anyway, that's a that's not really related to this topic at all, but um, and I've talked a lot about that sort of stuff in the past, but um, In a lot of ways, this game is where it, it uh, you know, a lot of things started for me. There's a, uh, you know, I think there was Super Metroid, which I think was one of the first games I got in the mail from a publisher. And I was, you know, really not doing much at the time. So they, it was cool that they sent it. Uh, I wasn't really in a position to cover it in a way that mattered, but, uh, you know, um, But, uh, yeah, you know, these, these home versions of Mortal Kombat, well, let's, let's, uh, let's cheat a little bit here. What have we, what do we got? What's MAME got for us these days? Um, one button fatalities, infinite fatality time. Always have reptile clues. Hmm. 
Access Reptile on any stage with no requirements. Let's do that. Maybe that'll be... Let's also uh, become invincible. Where's that? There. Fatality is the key. Just the, like stuff like that, like hey, like a, a green ninja is gonna randomly just jump in and and give you a little clue about something like yeah, that stuff that was only in later revisions of the game. Um, will we get another one here for round two? You will, yeah. Alone is how to find me. So you can't play two player. You know, Sub-Zero doesn't need anything else. You know, the slide, the ice. That's it, man. Actually, no, when he got the ground ice in Mortal Kombat 2, it was like, it felt like fucking crazy. All right, so we're cheating, so we're not going to fight him in the bottom of the pit, I think. Because, well, maybe it'll teleport us there, but we're, we have the always fight reptile cheat turned on, so. In fact, will we get a reptile clue? Oh, no. Okay, so. I did this a couple of times uh, in, in arcades. You know, you had to, like, I think, you know, you had to get to the pit stage, which is, you know, above us here. Um... And then one out of every however many times, uh, you would see a shadow flying past the moon. And if you were on the pit stage and there was a shadow flying past the moon, then I, you had to beat the fight without blocking, I think was maybe what it was. And then if you did that, you would fight Reptile. And then so you would get to this fight of like, here's a green ninja with Scorpion's moves, Scorpion's name on the life bar. Um, uh, and he moves super fast and just sucks to fight. It's like super annoying. And he just, he, oh, I guess he, yeah, he does, he does Sub-Zero and Scorpion's moves. It's, it's crazy. And so that was another thing that like, you know, someone would say they saw it and you'd be like, bullshit. How'd you do it? And they would go, well, I think I did this. Or they would just lie to you because people were assholes. Um, and then you would waste a bunch of quarters trying to figure it out. That was uh, part of the thrill in a weird way. <laughs> Um, let's turn on infinite time here so we can actually try to win this fight. I don't know if it, uh, we'll get there eventually. We'll chip him out with this slide if we, if we have to. And we're gonna have to. I don't know that I ever beat Reptile uh, once you once you get there. Ten million points. Not bad. Not bad. I'll be right back. It's gonna fight Reptile again. I gotta go let my wife in. I accidentally locked the door. Hang on.
Um, you know, and so obviously the game would would come home. Um, let's just quickly take a look at the SNES and Genesis versions here. Um, the SNES, you know, the the home the home situation for Mortal Kombat One was. A bummer all around. Um, because you had the SNES with the perfect controller for it. It had five, you know, it had enough buttons uh, in the right configuration to make sense to translate the kind of five button action of Mortal Kombat. But that version does not play well. We'll, uh, I think I might have to come back here and say hello. And then we can switch back here and I can, uh, there we go. Um, now when this game came out, the game genie was also a cool big deal. And, and so there were game genie codes for just like, turn the, the sweat red. So it looks like blood and, you know, just like real goofy stuff like that. <laughs> um, What do we have here? Let's just let's just turn this down a little bit. And... It's funny going from one to the other. The, the PC version of this ended up being a really great port. But so you had this SNES version where like that looks pretty good, but it is so stiff. It doesn't play anything like the arcade version. The, the timing, like everything about the moves feels different and bad. Which is a shame because like when you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, I mean, like it's, it's very recognizable as Mortal Kombat. And so that was a that was a bigger problem, I think, than anything involving the fatalities. Like that's what, that stuff was a bummer, right? And we'll see what he does here. Yeah, which that kind of became his MK2 fatality and sort of a sort of, um, which is funny. Finishing bonus, not fatality. Finishing bonus. And so they came up with these kind of bloodless fatalities. And I think Scorpions is maybe the only one that remains untouched. Um, but like a lot of the speed of the, like the, a lot of the movement is, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the slide out here. There it goes. Like it just feels bad. So if you were, you know, if you had gotten really good at juggle, juggling and some of the other combo stuff in the arcade, but whatever, even just the timing on the regular moves felt bad. It wasn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't have to be like an expert at the game to go like, oh, this feels so stiff. Every movement, everything ta feels like it takes a little bit longer to happen. Even just like pushing right on the stick to start moving feels like it takes longer. Like there's just a, a latency, a lag to the movement and everything in this game that just feels terrible. And so that just ruins it. And we played hundreds of hours of this version of the game competitive, you know, like, like versus mode, like all that stuff. Cause you know, what were you going to do? You're going to go play 50 cents a pop at the arcade. Like, no. And so you had this janky version of the game. Scorpion wins. Or you had the Genesis version. Which we'll we'll fire up here. And the gen the problem with the Genesis 
was that it was a three button controller. Um, oh, I, I had to rename some stuff to make it work on the mister. And so my Genesis games are now in a directory named mega drive. It's a whole thing. Hang on. We can fix this. Okay, what are the... I'm trying to remember what A, B, C is. A, B, A, C, A, B, B. There we go. Um, so you had a code there. That's where the A, B, A, C, A, B, B code comes from. And uh, is, is you would enter that there in order to unlock the blood and the fatalities. Um... But with it being a three button controller or four, if you count the start button, they had to collapse a lot of the movement down. Fight. Um, to the point where, so it's the start button is block, which on the Genesis controller doesn't feel good. I don't remember how to do the, the um, sweep. I can do this roundhouse all day long. Oh, that's what it is. It, you get you get one punch button, two kick buttons, and the start button is block. Fight. You know, the Genesis sound hardware, I love it, but... Excellent. Uh, it's a little goofy sometimes. So here you have like no sound effects. The music is kind of hilarious. The text treatment is all crazy. Like, like this is a, a very, you know, shadows. It's incredibly janky version of the game, but it plays so much closer to the arcade version that this became the version to play. And you know, of course, like if people wanted fatalities, there's obviously that whole conversation, but like, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna say that fatalities don't matter, because obviously they do. They're a big calling card for the franchise. But I think even back then, you know, like if, if this game had played like total garbage, like no one, you know, who woulda? Oops. Um. Just like so pronounced on the Genesis version. That's that noise is what I associate with this version. Like that's to me the Genesis version of this game. Um So, you know, obviously Sega had a six button controller. Um And this I wanna say maybe even this game had activator support. Like the six button controller, I'm trying to remember the timeline, but the six button controller was not available at this at this point, or it would have just become available. Um, let's see, that's going to be probably in core options. So we'll change that to six button pad, and then we'll restart, and I'll we'll see if it uh, if this recognizes. I think it may. do it the other way this time down up left left a right down dullard blood on cheat on um you can kind of set some of these flags will make it so reptile always shows up some of them give you infinite health or something um So let's see now that we now that we have a six button plugged in. Fight. Yeah. 
So this had six-button controller support, and it was probably one of the first games to do so, in fact. Um, now, mapped to the controller I'm using, that's actually way harder to figure out because <laughs> it's not, you know, a, the, the, the Genesis six-button controller was two rows of three, like a very Street Fighter-style configuration. Okay, so that's our low kick and that's our high kick. So they, they did a thing where the slide in the Genesis versions of the game was back and both kick buttons. Uh, you didn't need to hit block because that was like the start button or whatever. And But you see, you know, obviously this version has shortcomings of its own, but because it played so much closer to the arcade, like a lot of the hop punch stuff works here and a lot of the same basic concepts that you can do in the arcade fit here and and it just feels peppier snappier like, like more responsive on the controls like like everything about that made this the version to play the fatalities of course mattered too but like the color depth the presentation like there's so much stuff that's so wor so much worse about this version compared to the snes that it really became this toss up of just like, man, neither version is getting you what you want. It wasn't until the PC version came out or I finally got my hands on a PC. I didn't even own a PC at this point, I don't think. Um, maybe I was just coming into, yeah, I would have I would have gotten a PC around this time. So the CD-ROM, the PC version of this game is a great, great port. Uh, it blows both of these versions away. It's so close to the arcade. It's so well done. Um, But it was very hard to get two controllers hooked up to a PC so you could only play against the AI, which was no fun. <laughs> um, so like even that had its own shortcomings that were very frustrating to deal with. And, you know, it wouldn't be until Mortal Kombat 2 came out that the home versions were taken a lot more seriously and acclaimed it a much better job um, with those. Well, I guess whoever, you know, probe and sculpture to whoever did the, the port work. Um, MK2 was a much better home experience than MK1 ever was. So this this is this part of it is kind of forgotten to time a little bit. And it only really comes up in the context of the conversations around video game violence and Nintendo not allowing the fatalities in MK1 and then getting outsold by a huge margin. Uh, and so when MK2 came around, they suddenly their their moral compass fell somewhere like I can't reach it. <laughs> I don't know, put the murdering in. Uh, we've got a rating system now. It's fine. Put the murdering in. Uh, so, you know, that that kind of... We, we moved forward from there and didn't have to worry about secret codes and, and censorship, you know, like all that. So, um, It's all fun to look back on it now. You know, think, think about these weird home versions and, you know, like the Game Boy was huge. It's like a terrible Game Boy version of the game. You know, the Game Gear, just like all these, because you know, it was such a popular thing, it had to get ported everywhere. Uh, and all these systems that couldn't handle it. It's kind of like how MK1 came out on the Switch. You're like, well, there's money to be made. I guess they should do that. And you look at it and you're like, ah, this is, I don't think anyone's going to be truly happy with this other than in the context of, hey, it, it exists on the Switch. That's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> but, uh, I have not I have not played that version for myself, but I, yeah. Anyway, um, Mortal Kombat is a treasure, uh, and it's uh, it's what it's so cool that it's something that still matters so much thirty years later. I think it, it had its doldrums there in the uh, in the two thousands. You know when when those PS2 and Xbox games were coming out, like I, th those games were really cool in different ways because that's, that's when the story really grew. The lore really grew in some directions that were not, you know, a lot of characters, uh, were created for those games that, that really didn't go anywhere. But now some of them are getting that second life here in, in the game that just came out in, in Mortal Kombat one, uh, and so it's neat to even see like, oh, I guess Lee May is cool now. 
I guess Darius is kind of neat as a cameo character or whatever else. So like the idea that they're doing right by some of those characters all these years later is kind of fun. Um, but Mortal Kombat 1 is a landmark moment for video games and a landmark moment in my life. Um, and um, I think, you know, if, if that franchise hadn't existed, the friendships that I made along the way, um, you know, none of that would have happened. And, and I think that things would have gone, things could have gone very differently for me in terms of just like what happened and where I ended up and job wise and this and that. And, you know, like, like there was, um, a lot of it is wrapped up in, in, in me getting on Usenet and reading alt games, MK and going to the pizza place to try mortal Kombat two fatalities and verify that, yes, this is really the one. And then they put out that revision that changed all the inputs for all the fatalities, which was the dirtiest trick in the world at the time. People were like trying to boycott the game. They're like, they're, they're just trying to get more money out of more quarters out of us by changing all the inputs. This is filthy. I won't stand for it. Like people were mad. Uh, if you don't remember, so like when Mortal Kombat 2 came out, the, you know, people figured out how to do all the fatalities and then a revision came out that would like added more fatalities that were missing and then also changed a ton of the inputs for how you did them. And so all the months of work that people had been doing to build their facts and go like, oh, this is how you do this one. This is how you do this. All that stuff was gone. <laughs> Uh, and there was some overlap there where some arcades had the new version and some didn't, and you didn't know, you know, like you had to turn the machine on and off to know for sure what you were playing. And let me tell you, arcade operators really don't like it when you turn their machines off. They will threaten to throw you out of an arcade for that. I've, I've been there. Um, yeah. So if it wasn't for this game, um, this game specifically the first game in the franchise you know because I, I think the the it casts a long shadow and you know you my career and this game started around the same time in a lot of ways and um so there's just a lot of weird moments where this franchise kind of comes back in and intersects with where i'm at and you know that that's just how it's gone um but in these early days the friendships i formed playing this game playing it competitively talking about people that worked at magazines about this game. Like, you know, you start to find a language for talking about games professionally. And this is sort of one of the first games where I started having those sorts of conversations. And, uh, and it's, I, I also think the, the importance it has to the industry at large, again, for as much as people want to write it off as like, oh, it's just murdering this and that, which people still, all these years later kind of throw that and i think it, the, the franchise has never been um with this last run they've been on these last three or four games it's never been more of a meaningful fighting game than it has been right now in terms of a competitive scene and you know like the 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 seriousness which with which players take mortal Kombat competitively um Back then it was, you know, you had, I remember Glenn probably coined it at the time, though he probably wasn't the only person to say it, you know, like the, the idea was like, oh, Mortal Kombat is checkers, Street Fighter is chess. And I think that when you look at MK1, I think that's still kind of true. Um, MK2, I think kind of washes a lot of that away, especially when you consider that Mortal Kombat 2 came out against like super Street Fighter 2. Like they were still just like, I don't know, we got four new characters. And meanwhile, they're like, we got Jax, we got this, we got all these new characters, new backgrounds, new everything. Um. Anyway, sorry, I, I, it's hard to focus. Like I'm trying to focus on Mortal Kombat, the original video game, because we will probably talk more about the rest of the franchise or other games in the franchise later. Um. But, you know, it casts a long shadow. And, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I can't, I can't overstate its importance to me on a personal level. Um, as much as Mortal Kombat has not aged super well. Um, I think that there's, again, there's something about the rawness of it, the look, the feel, the lore, the characters, their backgrounds, the story, 
Like there's stuff about the first Mortal Kombat that the franchise kind of never had again. Um, I kind of just never, never had that, you know, because it always like for, it always leaned further and further into that kind of goofy side. Or, or achieve that balance of just like, here's some hardcore murdering, but also a baby, you know, and, and or whatever it else uh, you, you want to say. But going back to that first game again, with the martial arts movie influence, the, the like that style, the Jean Claude Van Damme influence on that game, um, gives it a feel that none of the other games ever had, really. Um, and I don't know, man. I, I I don't know that they could get away with it anymore. You know, the, the idea of like, could they take it back to this? Because I think they've had games where you look at it and go like, oh, they're kind of taking it back to when it was gruesome, like the first game. And, you know, some of the stuff, some of the conversations around Mortal Kombat X were were that way. It was like, oh, we're kind of taking it back to this, you know, it's, it's like a more gr- and, and, and grisly. It's gotten too goofy. And I agree. And and I, But I think those the the last three games have also been kind of goofy in different ways they've just struck a better balance about it um but uh anyway i love mortal kombat the the first game in the franchise as well as the franchise um but the first game in the franchise to again limit the conversation scope a little bit um yeah it, it's it's a it's a it's a great game it was an obsession uh, in a way that even Street Fighter 2 wasn't. I, play, I was playing a lot of Street Fighter 2 in arcades at the time. And when that game came home, I certainly played a whole lot of it. But Mortal Kombat was a thing you could think about when you weren't playing it. And I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about Street Fighter. I was like, you'd go play Street Fighter 2 and you're like, oh, this is a cool thing to do. Me and two or three of my friends were going to the arcade. We're going to play this. Or when this NES version finally came out. Everyone's going to come over to one place where, you know, we found someone that had some beers and we're going to play Street Fighter. Um, but Mortal Kombat was more than that. It always felt like more than that. It still feels like more than that in a lot of ways. Um, and all that is why it's a very easy inclusion here in the Jeff Gersman Hall of Fame. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, we'll be back, uh, next time with more, more games. This is, yeah, I don't know. Between this, we, we, <laughs> between this and res and blitz, like where the, the games that I've got like deep, 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 deep personal feelings about, like, like, like we're, we've hit a lot of those. Um, there are a lot of games on a list that I'm like, these are definitely hall of fame games, but like with the the back to back of res and mortal Kombat one is like, uh, I don't know. There's, there's, or there are emotions wrapped up in those games, I guess I would say. Um, as well as just the kind of critical analysis it makes it that much more complicated. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for watching. Um, thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Uh, for helping make all of this a reality. I'm, I, 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 we'll, we'll have to talk about Rygar at some point because Rygar is a, a game that will certainly be included in the Hall of Fame at one point, but we've, we've been talking about Rygar so much as we've been ranking these 8-bit Nintendo games that you know, kind of um, we'll, we'll wrap back around to talk about that in a slightly more official way uh, down the line. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been... It's, I've been having a great time doing all that stuff too. So thanks everyone for uh, supporting this. If you're interested in getting access to, you know, some more stuff, uh, you know, ad free audio, uh, if you want the access to game boys to men, which is a show where Glenn Rubenstein and I, you know, Glenn is the person that got me into this back in 92, um, where we're talking about a lot of, you know, our kind of formative years and, and our pathway through the, through covering video games and, and everything. And it's, uh, that's been, that's been a very interesting run as well. So definitely check that out. If you want more, if you want more in this kind of like, let's talk about stuff from the nineties vein like this, that, that show is, is exactly what you're looking for. Uh, you can find more at patreoncom slash Jeff Gerstman. Um, and thanks everyone 
for uh for hanging out i'll see you next time